Good evening. How you doing? This is Edward E. French. Before I commence tonight's nauseating narrative, I thought it prudent to first deliver a word of friendly warning. This story is intended for mature listeners only. Anthony Boucher's wackily strange tale deals with such pleasant subjects as free-range homicide, human dismemberment, cannibalism, blood sacrifice, hostile supernatural beings, and even the strangulation of an innocent house pet. A dog, followed by chowing down on its raw carcass. So you can see this story is not intended to be listened to by small children or the mentally deranged. Have them leave the room now. All characters and events in our terror tale, even those based on real people, are entirely fictional. I know it will thrill you, chill you, and maybe even surprise you a little. So let's get to it, shall we? Let us commence with the soul-shattering, bone-cracking tale I call They Bite. There was no path, only the almost vertical ascent. Crumbled rock for a few yards, with the roots of sage finding their scanty life in the dry soil. Then jagged outcroppings of crude crags, sometimes with accidental footholds, sometimes with overhanging and untrustworthy branches of greasewood, sometimes with no aid to climbing but the leverage of your muscles and the ingenuity of your balance. The sage was as drably green as the rock was drably brown. The only color was the occasional rosy spikes of a barrel cactus. The earth was dry, and the wind was dry and cold. Yu Talent swung himself up to the last pinnacle. It had a deliberate, shaped look about it, a petrified forest of Lilliputians, a Gibraltar of pygmies, Talent perched on its battlements and unslung his field glasses. The desert valley spread below him. The tiny cluster of buildings that was Oasis, the exiguous cluster of palms that gave name to the town and shelter to his own tent and to the shack he was building, the dead-ended highway leading straightforwardly to nothing, the oil roads diagramming the vacant blocks of optimistic subdivision. Talent saw none of these. His glasses were fixed beyond the oasis and the town of Oasis on the dry lake. The gliders were clear and vivid to him, and the uniformed men busy with them were as sharply and minutely visible as a nest of ants under glass. The training school was more than usually active. One glider in particular, strange to Talent, seemed the focus of attention men would come and examine it and glance back at the older models in comparison. Only the corner of Talon's left eye was not preoccupied with the new glider. In that corner, something moved. Something little and thin and brown as the earth. Too large for a rabbit, much too small for a man. It darted across that corner of vision, and Talon found gliders oddly hard to concentrate on. He set down the bifocals and deliberately looked about him. His pinnacle surveyed the narrow, flat area of the crest. Nothing stirred. Nothing stood out against the sage and rock, but one barrel of rosy spikes. He took up the glasses again and resumed his observations. When he was done, he methodically entered the results in the little black notebook. His hand was still white. The desert is cold and often sunless in winter, but it was a firm hand and as well trained as his eyes, fully capable of recording faithfully the designs and dimensions which they had registered so accurately. Once his hand slipped and he had to erase and redraw, leaving a smudge that displeased him. The lean brown thing had slipped across the edge of his vision again. Going toward the east edge, he would swear. 
where that set of rocks jutted like the spines on the back of a stegosaur. Only when his notes were completed did he yield to curiosity, and even then with cynical self-reproach. He was physically tired, for him an unusual state, from his daily climbing and from clearing the ground for his shack to be. The eye muscles play odd nervous tricks. There could be nothing behind the stegosaur's armor. There was nothing, nothing alive and moving. Only the torn and half-plucked carcass of a bird, which looked as though it had been gnawed by some small animal. It was halfway down the hill, hill in western technology, though anywhere east of the Rockies it would have been considered a sizable mountain, that Talent again had a glimpse of a moving figure. But this was no trick of a nervous eye. It was not little, nor thin, nor brown. It was tall and broad, and wore a loud red and black lumberjack. It bellowed, Talent! in a cheerful and lusty voice. Talent drew near the man, and said, Hello? He paused and added, Your advantage, I think. The man grinned broadly. Don't know me? Well, I dare say, ten years is a long time. And the California desert ain't exactly the Chinese rice fields. How's stuff? Still loaded down with secrets for sale? Talent tried desperately not to react to that shot, but he stiffened a little. Sorry. The prospect to get up had me fooled. Good to see you again, Morgan. The man's eyes had narrowed. Just having my little joke, he smiled. Of course you wouldn't have no serious reason for mountain climbing around a glider school, now would you? And you kind of need field glasses to keep an eye on the pretty birdies. I'm out here for my health. Talon's voice sounded unnatural even to himself. Sure, sure, you were always in it for your health. And come to think of it, my own health ain't been none too good lately. I've got me a little cabin way the hell and gone around here, and I do me a little prospecting now and then. And somehow it just strikes me, Talon, like maybe I hit a pretty good load today. Nonsense, old man. You can see. <laughs> I sure hate to tell any of them army men out at the field some of the stories I know about China and the kind of men I used to know out there. Who wouldn't cotton to them stories a bit, the army wouldn't. But if I was to have a drink too many and get talkative like... Tell you what, Talent suggested brusquely. It's getting near sunset now. My tent's chilly for evening visits. But drop around in the morning and we'll talk over old times. Is rum still your tipple? Sure is. Kind of expensive now, you understand. I'll lay some in. You can find the place easily, over by the oasis. And we... We might be able to talk about your prospecting, too. Talon's thin lips were set firm as he walked away. The bartender opened a bottle of beer and plunged it on the damp, circled counter. That, that'll be twenty cents, he said, then added as an afterthought. Want a glass? Sometimes tourists do. Talent looked at the others sitting at the counter. The red-eyed and unshaven old man, the flight sergeant unhappily drinking a Coke. It was after army hours for beer. The young man with the long, dirty trench coat and the pipe and the new-looking brown beard and saw no glasses. I guess I won't be a tourist, he decided. This was the first time Talent had had a chance to visit the desert sports spot. It was as well to be seen around in a community. Otherwise people begin to wonder and say, who is that man out by the oasis? Why don't you ever see him any place? The sports spot was quiet that night. The four of them at the counter, two army boys shooting pool, and a half dozen of the local men gathered about a round poker table, soberly and wordlessly cleaning a construction worker whose mind seemed more on his beer than on his cards. You just passing through? the bartender asked sociably. Talent shook his head. I'm moving in. When the army turned me down for my lungs, I decided I'd better do something about it. 
heard so much about your climate here, I thought I might as well try it. Sure thing. The bartender nodded. Up until they started this glider school, just about every other guy you meet in the desert is here for his health. Me? I had sinus. And look at me now. It's the air. Talent breathed the atmosphere of smoke and beer suds, but did not smile. I'm looking forward to miracles. You'll get them. Whereabouts you staying? Over that way a bit. The agent called it the old Carker place. Talent felt a curious listening silence and frowned. The bartender had started to speak and then thought better of it. The young man with the beard looked at him oddly. The old man fixed him with red and watery eyes that had a faded glint of pity in them. For a moment Talent felt a chill that had nothing to do with the night air of the desert. Then the construction worker in the poker game brandished an empty bottle and yelled, Hey! The bartender turned to fill the order, and the cold instant melted. The old man drank his beer in quick gulps and frowned as though trying to formulate a sentence. At last he wiped the beer from his bristly lips and said, You wasn't aiming to stay in the adobe, was you? No. It's pretty much gone to pieces. Easier to rig me up a little shack than try to make the adobe livable. Meanwhile, I've got a tent. That's all right, then, maybe. But mind, you don't go poking around that there adobe. I don't think I'm apt to. But why not? Want another beer? The old man shook his head reluctantly and slid from his stool to the ground. No, thanks. I don't rightly know as I... Yes? Nothing. Thanks all the same. He turned and shuffled to the door. Talent smiled. But why should I stay clear of the adobe? He called after him. The old man mumbled. What? They, they bite, said the old man, and went out shivering into the night. The bartender was back at his post. I'm glad he didn't take that uh, beer you offered him, he said. Long about this time in the evening, I have to stop serving him. For once he had the sense to quit. Talon pushed his own empty bottle forward. I hope I didn't frighten him away. Frighten? Well, mister, I think maybe that's just what you did do. He didn't want beer that sort of came, like you might say, from the old Carker place. Some of the old-timers, they're funny that way. Talent grinned. Is it haunted? Not what you'd call haunted, no. No ghosts there that I ever heard of. He wiped the counter with a cloth and seemed to wipe the subject away with it. The flight sergeant pushed his Coke bottle away, hunted his pocket for nickels and went over to the pinball machine. The young man with the beard slid onto his vacant stool I hope old Jake didn't worry you, he said. <laughs> I suppose every town has its deserted homestead with a grisly tradition. But this sounds a little different. No ghosts. And they bite? Do you know something about it? Just enough to... Talent was curious. Have one on me and tell me about it. The flight sergeant swore bitterly at the machine. Beer gurgled through the beard. You see? The young man began. The desert's so big you can't be alone in it. You ever notice that? It's all empty and there's nothing in sight. But there's always something moving over there where you can't quite see it. It's something very dry and thin and brown. Only when you look around, it isn't there. Ever see it? Optical fatigue. Talent began. Sure. <laughs> I know. Every man to his own legend. There isn't a tribe of Indians hasn't got some way of accounting for it. You've heard of the Watchers? And the 20th century white man comes along and it's optical fatigue. Only in the 19th century, things weren't quite the same. And there were the Carkers. 
You've got a special, localized legend? Call it that. You glimpse things out of the corner of your mind, same like you glimpse lean, dry things out of the corner of your eye. You encase them in solid circumstance, and they're not so bad. That is known as the growth of legend, the folk mind in action. You take the carkers and the things you don't quite see and put them together, and they bite. Talent wondered how long that beard had been absorbing beer, and what were the carkers, he prompted politely. You ever hear a sawny bean? Scotland, reign of James I, or maybe the sixth, though I think Roughhead's wrong on that for once. Or let's be more modern. You ever hear of the Benders? Kansas in the 1870s? No. You ever hear of Procrustes or Polyphemus or fee fi fo fum There are ogres, you know. They're no legend. They're fact they are. The inn where nine guests left for every ten that arrived, the mountain cabin that sheltered travelers from the snow, sheltered them all winter till the melting spring uncovered their bones. The lonely stretches of road that so many passengers traveled halfway. You'll find them everywhere, all over Europe, and pretty much in this country, too, before communications became what they are. Profitable business. And it wasn't just the profit. The benders made money, sure, but that wasn't why they killed all their victims as carefully as a kosher butcher. Shawnee Bean got so he didn't give a damn about the profit. He just needed to lay in more meat for the winter. And think of the chances you'd have at an oasis. So these carkers of yours were, as you call them, ogres? Carkers, ogres, maybe they were the benders. The benders were never seen alive, you know, after the townspeople found those curiously butchered bodies. There's a rumor they got this far west, and the time checks pretty well. There wasn't any town here in the 80s, just a couple of Indian families, last of a dying tribe living at the oasis. They vanished after the carkers moved in. That's not so surprising. The white race is a sort of super ogre anyway. Nobody worried about them. But they used to worry about why so many travelers never got across this stretch of desert. The travelers used to stop over at the Carkers, you see, and somehow they often never got any further. Their wagons had been found maybe 15 miles beyond in the desert. Sometimes they found the bones, too, parched and white, gnawed-looking, they said sometimes. And nobody ever did anything about these carkers? Oh, sure. We didn't have King James the Sixth. only I still think it was the first to ride up on a great white horse for a gesture. But twice there were army detachments came here and wiped them all out. Twice? <laughs> One wiping out would do for most families. Talent smiled at the beery confusion of the young man's speech. Uh-huh. That was no slip. They wiped out the carkers twice. Because, you see, once didn't do any good. They wiped him out, and still travelers vanished, and still there were white gnawed bones. So they wiped him out again. After that they gave up, and people detoured the oasis. It made a longer, harder trip, but after all... <laughs> you mean these carkers of yours were immortal? I don't know about immortal. They somehow just didn't die very easy. Maybe, if they were the benders, and I sort of like to think they were. They learned a little more about what they were doing out here on the desert. Maybe they put together what the Indians knew and what they knew, and it worked. Maybe whatever they made their sacrifices to understood them better out here than in Kansas. And what's become of them, <laughs> aside from seeing them out of the corner of the eye? 
There's 40 years between the last of the Carker history and this new settlement at the Oasis, and people won't talk much about what they learned here in the first year or so. Only that they stay away from that old Carker adobe. They tell some stories. The priest says he was sitting in the congressional one hot Saturday afternoon and thought he heard a penitent come in. He waited a long time and finally lifted the gauze to see was anybody there. Somebody was there. And it bit. He's got three fingers on his right hand now, which looks funny as hell when he gives a benediction. Talon pushed their two bottles toward the bartender. That yarn, my young friend, has earned another beer. How about it, bartender? Is he always cheerful like this, or is this just something he's improvised for my benefit? The bartender set out the fresh bottles with great solemnity. Me? I wouldn't have told you all that myself. But then he's a stranger, too, and maybe don't feel the same way we do here. For him, it's just a story. It's more comfortable that way. But as long as you've heard that much, you might as well. It was last winter when we had that cold spell. You heard funny stories that winter. Wolves coming into prospectors' cabins just to warm up. Well, business wasn't so good. We don't have a license for hard liquor, and the boys don't drink much beer when it's that cold, but they used to come in anyway because we've got that big oil burner. So one night, there's a bunch of them in here. Old Jake was here that you was talking to, and his dog, Jigger. And I think I hear somebody else come in. The door creaks a little. But I don't see nobody in the poker games going, and we're talking just like we're talking now. And all of a sudden, I, I hear a kind of noise, like crack, over there in that corner behind the jukebox near the burner. I go over to see what goes, and it gets away before I can see it very good, but it was little and thin. And it didn't have no clothes on. It must have been damned cold that winter. And what was the cracking noise? Talent asked dutifully. That? That was a bone. It must have strangled Jigger without any noise. He was a little dog. It ate most of the flesh, and if it hadn't cracked the bone for the marrow, it could have finished. You can still see the spots over there. That blood never did come out. There had been silence all through the story. Now suddenly all hell broke loose. The flight sergeant let out a splendid yell and began pointing excitedly at the pinball machine and yelling for his payoff. The construction worker dramatically deserted the poker game, knocking his chair over in the process, and announced lugubriously that these guys here had their own rules, see? Any atmosphere of Carker-inspired horror was dissipated. Talent whistled as he walked over to put a nickel in the jukebox. He glanced casually at the floor. Yes, there was a stain, for what that was worth. He smiled cheerfully and felt rather grateful to the Carkers. They were going to solve his blackmail problem very neatly. Talent dreamed of power that night. It was a common dream with him. He was a ruler of the new American corporate state that should follow the war, and he said to this man, Come, and he came, and to that man, Go, and he went, and to his servants, do this, and they did. Then the young man with the beard was standing before him, and the dirty trench coat was like the robes of an ancient prophet, and the young man said, You see yourself riding high, don't you? 
riding the crest of the wave, the wave of the future, you call it. But there's a deep, dark undertow that you don't see, and that's a part of the past, and the present, and even your future. There is evil in mankind that is blacker even than your evil, and infinitely more ancient. And there was something in the shadows behind the young man, something little and lean and brown. Talon's dream did not disturb him the following morning, nor did the thought of the approaching interview with Morgan. He fried his bacon and eggs and devoured them cheerfully. The wind had died down for a change, and the sun was warm enough so that he could strip to the waist while he cleared land for his shack. His machete glinted brilliantly as it swung through the air and struck at the roots of the sagebrush. Morgan's full face was red and sweating when he arrived. It's cool over there in the shade of the adobe, Talent suggested. We'll be more comfortable. And in the comfortable shade of the adobe he swung his machete once and clove Morgan's full red sweating face in two. It was so simple. It took less effort than uprooting a clump of sage. And it was so safe. Morgan lived in a cabin way to hell and gone and was often away on prospecting trips. No one would notice his absence for months, if then. No one had any reason to connect him with talent. And no one in Oasis would hunt for him in the Carker-haunted adobe. The body was heavy, and the blood dripped warm on Talon's spare skin. With relief he dumped what had been Morgan on the floor of the adobe. There were no boards, no flooring, just the earth, hard, but not too hard to dig a grave in. And no one was likely to come poking around in this taboo territory to notice the grave. Let a year or so go by, and the grave and the bones it contained would simply be attributed to the Carkers. The corner of Talon's eye bothered him again. Deliberately he looked about the interior of the adobe. The little furniture was crude and heavy, with no attempt to smooth down the strokes of the axe. It was held together with wooden pegs or half-rotted thongs, there were age-old cinders in the fireplace, and the dusty shards of a cooking jar among them. And there was a deeply hollowed stone, covered with stains that might have been rust, if stone rusted. Behind it was a tiny figure, clumsily fashioned of clay and sticks. It was something like a man, and something like a lizard, and something like the things that flit across the corner of the eye. Curious now, Talent peered about further. He penetrated to the corner that the one unglassed window lighted but dimly, and there he let out a little choking gasp. For a moment he was rigid with horror. Then he smiled and all but laughed aloud. This explained everything. Some curious individual had seen this, and from his account burgeoned the whole legend. The Carkers had indeed learned something from the Indians. But that secret was the art of embalming. It was a perfect mummy. Either the Indian art had shrunk bodies, or this was that of a ten-year-old boy. There was no flesh, only skin and bone, and taut, dry stretches of tendon between. The eyelids were closed. The sockets looked hollow under them. The nose was sunken and almost lost. The scant lips were tightly curled back from the long and very white teeth, which stood forth all the more brilliantly against the deep brown skin. It was a curious little trove, this mummy. Talent was already calculating the chances for raising a decent sum of money from an interested anthropologist. Murder can produce such delightfully profitable chance by-products. When he noticed the infinitesimal rise and fall of the chest, the Kaku was not dead. It was sleeping. 
Talon did not dare stop to think beyond the instant. This was no time to pause to consider if such things were possible in a well-ordered world. It was no time to reflect on the disposal of the body of Morgan. It was time to snatch up your machete and get out of there. But in the doorway he halted. There, coming across the desert, heading for the adobe, clearly seen this time in the center of the eye, was another, a female. He made an involuntary gesture of indecision. The blade of the machete clanged ringingly against the adobe wall. He heard the dry shuffling of a roused sleeper behind him. He turned fully now, the machete raised. Dispose of this nearer one first, then face the female. There was no room even for terror in his thoughts, only for action. The lean brown shape darted at him avidly. He moved lightly away and stood poised for its second charge. It shot forward again. He took one step back, machete arm raised, and fell headlong over the corpse of Morgan. Before he could rise, the thin thing was upon him, its sharp teeth had met through the palm of his left hand. The machete moved swiftly. The thin, dry body fell headless to the floor. There was no blood. The grip of the teeth did not relax. Pain coursed up Talon's left arm, a sharper, more bitter pain than you would expect from the bite, almost as though venom. He dropped the machete, and his strong white hand plucked and twisted at the dry brown lips. The teeth stayed clenched, unrelaxing. He sat bracing his back against the wall and gripped the head between his knees. He pulled, his flesh ripped, and blood formed dusty clots on the dirt floor. But the bite was firm. His world had become reduced now to that hand and that head. Nothing outside mattered. He must free himself. He raised his aching arm to his face, and with his own teeth he tore at that unrelenting grip. The dry flesh crumbled away in desert dust, but the teeth were locked fast. He tore his lip against the white keenness and tasted in his mouth the sweetness of blood and something else. He staggered to his feet again. He knew what he must do. Later he could use cautery, a tourniquet, see a doctor with a story about a Gila monster. Their heads grip too, don't they? But he knew what he must do now. He raised the machete and struck again. His white hand lay on the brown floor, gripped by the white teeth and the brown face. He propped himself against the adobe wall, momentarily unable to move. His open wrist hung over the deeply hollowed stone. His blood and his strength and his life poured out before the little figure of sticks and clay. The female stood in the doorway now, the sun bright on her thin brownness. She did not move. He knew that she was waiting for the hollow stone to fill. They bite. Written by Anthony Boucher. Narrated by Edward E. French. Good night.